bigger, not smaller. Even if there's consolidation, that number will continue to grow. Because the other thing you're going to see as your marketplace becomes more and more mature is that people's demands for different kinds of investment opportunities will also grow. And you're going to need to be in a position to offer those, um, to, to be able to, to offer those solutions to your clients. So, you know, they asked me to talk a little bit about solutions, and I didn't use the word, but that's really what I had in mind when I was talking about that quality conversation. Okay, I do think what is, which will never be dead, but I think it's going to be increasingly difficult to make a living as a purely transaction-based person. Now, if that's what you do, please don't take offense. I don't think you do anything wrong. Okay, I love salespeople of all types. I've grown up around them my whole life. But all of our, all of our needs and all of our goals need to be aligned. So mine need to be aligned with you, both financially and in what we offer, me as a manufacturer, you all with your client. You need to be paid fairly, but they need to be charged fairly and treated fairly. And, and, and you're going to see that happen. So you will see a convergence of pricing. When I started in the mutual fund industry, I don't know what it is in this, this market here. Forgive me for not finding out. But every single mutual fund purchase paid at least 8 and 3 quarter percent upfront sales charge. So if you gave me $100,000, I can't do the math, $91,500 was going to be invested on my behalf, and the other you know, 8000 went for commission. Now, you couldn't do that now to do anything, you know, to, you know, to save your life. You will see prices converge. You'll probably see, and maybe you already are, a move towards annuitizing your business, where more and more of what we offer for people when we try to align it is someone, the particular product that I represent, someone can choose an upfront commission, Someone can choose a mid-front with a lower trail, or someone can choose a very low upfront with a long-term trail. And I think that the best way long-term for those of us on this side of the equation of the industry to align our interests with our clients is to be paid based on our performance, long-term asset retention, and doing the best job we can for them, and not having to find a way to move their money, not having to find a way to, make the, to, to find the next dollar. So, random thought. I heard a nice young man say something about, we only need 100 clients. So when I started this business, much like today, I knew nothing. And I, I had a mentor. His name was Don Pitcher. He knew my father very well. Uh, and that's, that's why he was so nice to me. And after about a year or so in the business, like a year, I started in September, so it would have been a year and four months, right around we got around Christmas time, he said to me, Mark, I want you to give yourself a Christmas present. I said, Don, I'm broke. He said, that's not what I mean. He said, I want you to fire your worst client. I said, Don, I've been doing this for a year and a half. All my clients are small. I said, I didn't say small. I said, you're worth. Now, I'm paraphrasing because he didn't talk like this. He had a very gruff voice. He said, I want you to find that client that keeps you awake at night, that client that you want to hide when the phone rings, the one that sucks the energy out of the room every time he or she calls you, and I want you to call them up and say, it just seems like what you and I are doing together isn't working for you. I'd like to recommend you go to somebody down the hall, one of my colleagues, who I think you'll, be, you'll enjoy being with. I did that five years in a row. I made that call five years in a row. Four of the five years, my client said, no, 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 I love working with you. Everything's fine. And it gave us an opportunity to do what I think is very important, which was to set the expectations about what I thought I did for a living at the time, which, by the way, was wrong. Okay? I, wasn't, I, I wouldn't do it the same way now. And what, and what they should expect from me. The fifth one left, and we were both so happy. I hated her. She hated me. You know, it was just perfect. And I can tell you, and if there's any sales managers in the room, forgive me for this, there is not a commission big enough. There really isn't a client big enough that does that for you. They will ruin your life. They'll suck the energy out of your practice, and your other clients will suffer for it. You will suffer, and your family will suffer. Don't allow yourself to get that way. And what it comes down to is expectations. If you agree with what I'm saying here, if you agree with what I'm saying, and that our job is to have that quality conversation about goals, dreams, aspirations, risk tolerance, time frame, what keeps them awake at night, what they want to accomplish, you tell them, that's what I do. You tell them, my job is to protect you against yourself. And when the market takes a hiccup, and it will, I promise you there'll be a Wednesday when you're going to wake up and your portfolio is worth less than what it was on Tuesday. Okay, it's going to be my job to make sure that you don't make short-term decisions that are going to affect your long-term financial future. And by the way, conversely, when things are going particularly well in an asset class, I'm not going to allow you to pour more money into it. Do we agree? And remind, I, I know people actually write this out, or something like this. I never did that. Write this out. Do we agree? Set those expectations. Make them your clients for life. And as they get rich, you'll get richer. 
and you'll do better. There's only a couple of ways to get rich, and the only one I can think of that's legal is slowly. And that's, you know, it's just by doing the right thing over a long period of time and moving forward. But it did work, and it worked exceptionally well, uh, you know, for me. I heard someone up here talk about relationships. And, you know, so what's a relationship? I always tell my wholesalers that work for me that a relationship is not, a, is, is not when somebody allows you to take them out for an expensive dinner. A relationship is not when they allow you to take them out for a round of golf. A relationship is when you've gotten to the point where this individual will tell you their personal agenda and their business agenda and then allow you to work towards helping them accomplish that. That's what a relationship is. And that's not easy to get to. It means asking difficult questions, listening to answers. How much time do I have? I keep on looking at my watch and I forgot when I started. I have five minutes left? Damn. So, I gotta, so, so anyway, so that, that's what a relationship is for me, is, is what, when you go through that. So, Set that agenda, set those expectations, and stay with them. Before I forget, I want to give you my one sales idea. Okay, I've been using the sales idea around the world for, I don't know, 10, 15 years? Maybe more than that. I don't think I made it up, but I can't remember who I stole it from, so I'm going to take complete and utter credit. There was a study done by a large U.S. Um, wirehouse about how most of their advisors, they were brokers really, closed their interviews. And how they closed their interviews was some, some semblance of, what do you think? Right? That's how they closed it. And we all know why we do that, because we don't want the no. So if we don't say, give me a yes or no, and we say, what do we think? That's what we get. So, I want you to put yourself in a different situation. That, that, you, can remember, that you go see your physician. And you tell your physician things you may not tell your husband or your wife. You're not feeling good. They look at you at places nobody else sees. They touch you in places nobody else touches you. They go back and they do a bevy of tests. They come back with those tests, and they have this great write-up of what's wrong with you, okay? And then a great write-up of maybe what might make you feel better. And when they're all said and done, your physician says to you, so Mark, what do you think? My answer is, I think I need a new physician. If you get somebody to tell you about their goals and their dreams and their aspirations, where their money is, at least some of it, what they want to accomplish with that money, what frightens them, what keeps them awake at night, and what might make them comfortable to move forward, they are not looking for you, no matter what you think, to ask them what they think. So I'm going to give you another question to ask, because we're still all afraid of the no. And I can tell, and if, and if, you know, culturally I can't guarantee it, because I just don't know your culture that well, but I think it'll work, because it's worked everywhere else. Okay? Now, this is another question, which standing up here seems real easy to ask. And it'll take you a while to get used to it. But if you do it, I promise you it will change your life. I, in fact, I used this on my wife and kids for years until my wife figured it out. When you're done, what I want you to do is look your client in the face and say, do you know what it is I think you should do? Let me repeat it. Robbie, do you know what it is I think you should do? There's almost only one possible answer to that question, and that is no, Mark, what? And it puts you in a position that you were not in before you asked that question. Psychologically, emotionally, your client has given you permission to at least tell him or her, or them, what it is you think they should do. I cannot promise you they'll do it, but I can promise you that if you, if you use that at the end of your interviews, if I had a card, I'd give it to all of you, because I ask this all the time, do it 10 times and tell me what, ha what happens the 10 times. If you do it 10 times, I promise you it'll change your life as a, forgive the expression, but I happen to love them, because uh, I am one, Salesman or saleswoman, okay? It will change your life. It will really work well. So with that, I somehow got off track, and I didn't really talk too much about platforms. I hope that's okay. Um, but like I said, I think what I think about platforms is pretty immaterial. What's going to happen is going to happen, no matter what we think up here. What will happen is your clients will become, in their mind's eye, more sophisticated. They will become more cost conscious. You're, you're, um, you need to be on a system and a platform that allows you to allow your interests with theirs. That's terribly important, and you need to make sure that you're with manufacturers that allow you to allow their interest with yours and your clients. And as you're, as you're a growing nascent, uh, you're not nascent, but as you're growing and developing, if you will, industry, there will be some hiccups in that process. There will be decisions you'll have to make. And then when the market becomes mature enough, probably everybody pretty much converges to where they have to be, and your decision will, will be what kind of an advisor do I want to be within that context. So with that, I will thank you for your kind attention. That went by very quickly for me, probably a long time for you. Um, but it's the favorite part of the trip I had here. It was my first trip to India, by the way. 
so all the, all the traveling I do. So thanks everybody for the hospitality. Anybody have any questions? I want to want to challenge. Yes, sir. Do the microphone. I think it's on. Yeah. You've been around the world. You've been uh, seeing uh, various investors of different continents and uh, countries. We always feel that you know there is something wrong, and the right method is what has been uh, preached by you some time back and various other uh, successful advisors, uh, practitioners. What do you think is then? Is this, there's something wrong with the way Indian investor invest and the Indian advisor advise? And it really looks that both of both of them are happy, the advisor and the investor. That's why there is each and every goal being accomplished, maybe delayed or whatever. What according to you, so assuming that the, the ingredient or the process that is going on between advisor and the investor is uh, so far so good, but what we hear in this uh, conference is that, you know, this is the way forward. What according to you is the basic thing which is uh, there in, among Indians, their nature, characteristics, that, that their goals are, are achieved even with this uh, so-called traditional, not relevant, we don't respect asset allocation today in India yet. We don't respect what? Asset allocation. Asset allocation. Asset allocation. Asset allocation. Asset allocation. So what do you think is uh, uh, there um, in Indians that uh, goals are still achieved? I heard most of that except I didn't hear the very end. What do I think? What? The one? Repeat the best. What, what about it? So let, so I can, uh, let me give you an example, okay, and then have I, there might there Have might, you got the question right? I'm sorry? Have you got the question right? Okay, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that in many conferences, we talk about asset allocation, okay, scientific uh, way of appraising, creating portfolios, yep. linking to a goal. I am saying each and every Indian have been able to successfully achieve their goals with the same sort of advisors who are doing business, practicing with their old traditional ideas, mm -hmm. okay, and tools. What do you think, which is different in the Indian investors that is not with the uh, overseas investors that their goals are, are been achieved yeah. today also? So what so is that difference? What do I think is different about the Indian investors? Yeah. So. Um, I will, I will give you a quick example is that the product that I represent, the number one um, location of the individuals who purchase my product are Mexican, the number two are non-resident Indians. And about 70% of the non-resident Indians that own, that own the investment product that I represent use asset allocation models. So my personal experience is there is no difference. Now that may be a virtue of the, of the platform and the product that, that we put together that makes asset allocation easy. We have models that are in there. We do. We automatically rebalance, etc. That then I have something to do with it, but I but I, I don't know. By the way, I want to make I want to make one thing clear, is that is that I don't think enough people anywhere in the world do enough asset allocation. People don't like it. It's boring. They feel like they're missing opportunities. Some people that lived through the crisis say it didn't work in the crisis, but if you take a look, it really did. You take a look at diversified portfolios and what they did versus almost any single asset class, except for maybe cash. So I don't see a big difference. It usually comes down to sort of as the market maturates and, those, and, and more and more of that information starts to get out there and people like you start to talk about it. And it is, you know, and I think I said this, if I didn't, I'm going to say it now. If I can use an American colloquialism, it ain't easy. It's not easy to get our clients to look that way, but it is the best way. And asset allocation has a broad meaning. And I didn't get into it on purpose. There'll be some people here who love modern portfolio theory. There'll be some people that'll use something, another different black box. There'll be some that'll do it on their own, which by the way is better than not doing it at all by far. Once you have that conversation about the goals and the dreams and the aspirations, and you're going to decide this is how much equity we're comfortable with, this is how much fixed income we're comfortable with, and this is you know, the regions and the types of, of mutual funds we want. And to be on the right platform that allows you to make those decisions 
is important. The danger of a platform, by the way, is that your client may want to change their mind before they should. And um, I always get arguments about this, that's why I'm saving it for the very end, is that, in my view, the only reason to change your asset allocation is because your life situation has changed. It is never the market. Now that's a very, that, that's an absolute statement that's probably not absolutely true, but it's true so much of the time. If you live that way, you and your clients would be much better off than if you try to guess, you know, as to when those disadvantages are. The way I live, by the way, I'm 60 years old. I have not, I have not changed my asset allocation for eight years now. I look at my portfolio twice a year, drives my wife crazy. Look at it once because my advisor, advisor, yes, I don't do it myself. My advisor makes me and once because the tax man makes me. The only time I look at it. And I sleep much better than most of my friends. All right, I think I probably went over. Thank you. Be on the dice, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Uh, mind, uh, I'm hearing you for the second time. Yesterday, you kept awake everybody in CIA meet after, immediately after lunch and today after tea. <laughs> what do you think, uh, Mr. Mark? What do you think? You ask me to ask the question always, what do you think? No. <laughs> you know what I think you should do. So now I ask Bhatiaji to come on dais and honor Mr. Mark. Bhatiaji? Yes. Do you know what we have to do now? Yes. Clap. So I've taken your both the questions. You're both the questions. Oh, good.